Okay, everybody knows, of course, how to say, if there's a fire alarm, get out of the building. <laughs> right? We need one connector for that. It's not fire. Okay. Can we use the version that consumes the fire alarm in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. And there's another saying, if you can't stay in the cold, go back in. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Today I'm going to talk about um, more about proof search, and uh, we'll see how much it will get through. But I will talk about inversion and chaining, which are two methods for doing proof search. Do you have a question? No, 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 no. Oh. I was trying to block the stroke. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, hopefully nobody will have seizures either here or remotely. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, okay. So what did we last time? So. Um, we we're going to prove cut elimination, which is the, the, very, the, the very basic theorem that says if you can prove a, a sequence with cut, then you can also prove it without the cut. And the way we did that is we had two sequent calculi, one without cut and one with. Um, and then we, we showed basically the following theorem, namely that if with gamma and delta you can prove A, then gamma and delta, you can prove A. And so this is the calculus without cut, and this is the one that we started with, with it, which has cut in it. Okay? And this reduced to a particularly important lemma. Anybody remember what the lemma was? Consistency. Hmm? Uh, consistency was a consequence of it, but how did we actually prove this? Yeah, we proved admissibility of cut. So the theorem that we actually proved on the way was that this rule um, that this rule is admissible, okay? in the cut-free circuit calculus. Anybody remember what admissibility of a rule is? Yeah? It doesn't change, it doesn't add anything else as true when you add. Okay, it doesn't add anything new. Okay, another way to say the same thing is that whenever you can prove the premises, there is a proof of the conclusion. Okay, but we don't take it as a primitive inference rule. Why wouldn't you just take this as an inference rule? Yeah, this. Why don't you just take it as an infant? Um, yeah? Ben? Um, because it makes proving a bunch of things harder. Yeah, because the whole point is of this theorem is to eliminate it so that when we try to prove something, we don't have to consider this rule. Okay? So the structure of the proof is really important when we're trying to see if you can prove something. And so, um, so this is the meta theorem that we establish about it, but of course the whole idea of defining this was not to have the rule of cut so that we can actually search in a more directed way. Um, okay, so remember at the very beginning we said something about the harmony of the connectives, the left and the right rule actually working together. Um, and that was a very important part of this particular theorem, a proof of this theorem. Um, and the way it came in was to say, if, if the right rule introduced this A here is the last step, and the left rule introduced A here is the last step, then we're able to reduce the cut to smaller cuts, okay, using a cut reduction. And why were the new cuts smaller? Right, because this proposition A that we index the cut with actually gets smaller when we do the reduction. So that's what we checked before. Now the other thing we checked um, so you can think of the following relation. So cut reduction is a local property which only looks at the connective <coughs> itself, okay? And cut elimination with miscibility cut is a global property for the whole system once you've written out everything, okay? So locally cut reduction, globally admissibility of cut or cut elimination, okay? Now the other property we checked was which property? Identity, Identity expansion. Okay, and so that's a local property because we show how to prove, say, how to use identity at type A implies B and reduce it to identities at type A and B. Okay, so can anybody think about what might be the 
global version of identity expansion. Yeah? That um, it's only for primitive uh, for primitive uh, Okay, so Okay. So the idea is that we can take may, maybe this system or maybe an even more restricted one where the identity rule would be eliminated altogether, except that doesn't quite work, as Christina was already indicating. So we can't quite get this theorem because it would be this. If A, then you can prove A, identity at A. Okay, so we remove the identity and say, okay, instead of having it, we'll always try to be able to prove it, right? That would be the analog of doing it for cut. Now, got, cut turns out to be fully redundant, but the identity still we need in one place. Christina said it, but maybe somebody else can state it again. Yeah? The atomic one. Right. Um, so if A is an atomic formula, one that doesn't have any left or right rules associated with it, okay, then we won't be able to eliminate it because you know, there's nothing to reduce it to. There's nothing of the smaller propositions we can reduce it to. Okay. So we can think of this as being a derived rule, but we do need this one. An atomic formula P proves P and that's the identity at P, and that needs to be a rule even in this restricted sequence calculus. Yep. So, <clears throat> when we define identity lo locally, yeah. identity expansion and cut reduction, uh, we had no restriction really on like what other rules can be used there. But we could, for example, say that, oh, we have some proof of identity expansion where we use cut, and conversely, like, the cut reduction, the, the reduced proof term actually uses identity. Um, and then we wouldn't be able to, like, you know, they would be mutually dependent. Uh -huh. uh, so there is a possibility that we would not be able to eliminate both of them. Correct. Uh, and there are some Reddit rules that you can make up for which this happens. Okay. Uh, that's weird. Hmm? That's weird. That's weird, yeah. And No, no, but good sets of rules should not have this kind of properties. Okay, so, yeah. so it's reasonable to expect that they would not actually be dependent on Right, you would not expect this to actually happen if you have a well-designed system. Generally what happens is there are some local checks which might succeed, and then when you try to actually verify the global theorems, then they fail, because the local checks don't have the right, quite the right property to expand to the whole system. So the local text is always important to make sure that, you, that the rules that you have actually work, but you're not really fully completely done until you have verified the global version of the theorem at the end. Okay. I thought that we could, like if we strengthen the local check to say that, for example, in identity expansion, we can only use the right rule, the left rule for the connective and identity at smaller types. Yeah. That would help, but the problem is that if you think about extensions of the logic, right, almost always if you try to put too tight a box around it, then you have to generalize it. So for example, let's think about the identity expansion at type bang A. Okay, so that would be the identity, okay. Um, how do we actually prove this now? Right, we have to apply the left rule. The right rule doesn't apply because we have a linear assumption, right? So we use the bang left rule. And so we have A here. Now this is empty. Now we have that. And now how do we proceed from here? We do the right rule, right? So we have A. Okay, but now we're not done yet. Now we have to apply the copy rule. And then we can use the identity at A. So in the end, we reduced it from the identity at bang A to the identity at A. But we had to throw out this other rule into the middle, the copy rule. So as, as, you know, when you make these definitions too tight, then you, know, you have to change your mind about them. So the way I think about it is, let's try to keep these local checks informal. Okay, so as much as possible, we'll try to reduce identity at a type to only identity at smaller types. 
without only using the left and right rules. Um, but the real true check comes when you verify admissibility of cut and the fact that identity can be reduced only to atomic types. Um, so, right, how do we prove this? That we only need identity at atomic types. <coughs> So it's, it's an induction, okay, um, on what do we have, what do we have to work with? We only have given A, right, because the theorem says for any A, this is an admissible rule of inference, right? So we have nothing to work with except A. Most proofs go by structural induction, so we'll try structural induction on A. But also, you have done the e expansion, and the expansion takes, for example, identity at A tends to B to identity at A and t identity at B. So there's a good chance that, you know, doing induction on the structure of A will get you there because we already decomposed it that way. So let's look at the proof. Some cases, actually, let me do just, uh, um, actually, we can do the bang A case, right? Um, so we want to prove that this is a, 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 an admissible rule of inference, okay? So we apply this rule, this rule, this rule, and by induction hypothesis, this should be true, okay? Um, except not quite the induction hypothesis. Yeah? Yeah, so this is not quite an instance of the induction hypothesis because it's an extra A. So really what we want to say is, okay? Um, and this is because persistent assumptions don't have to be used, so they can be left over at the end. So we'll write that into our theorem. We write that into our rules here, and we also write into our theorem. Okay, so once we make that small change, then this is an instance of the induction hypothesis, except well, we should have started with a gamma here, right? Because, well, now we have to prove something more general. So we'll have a gamma here. You have a gamma and an A, gamma and an A, gamma and an A, okay? But now it is an instance of our induction hypothesis just for a larger gamma, which has an extra A in it, okay? Okay, so the identity is very easy to prove. And cut elimination, the admissibility of cut is the thing that's very hard to prove, okay? So let's think about the import of those theorems just a little bit, okay? So the identity theorem says that if you can use A, then you can... Um, uh, solve A as a goal, okay? And this theorem says that if you can actually solve A as a goal, then you're allowed to assume it, okay? So they go in the two directions between uses and goals, okay? So actually in the traditional li literature on logic, before linear logic came along, came along, there was slightly different notation. So this is, the thing on the left-hand side are still things that you can use. The thing on the right-hand side is something that you want to verify. Okay, so this here, the sequent calculus that looks like this is also sequent calculus of verifications. And what a verification is, a verification is sort of like a proof, except that you only examine subformulas of the thing that you're trying to prove. Okay. So verification always decomposes formulas in your sequent, okay? It doesn't go outside the thing that you're, that you're allowed to do with the proof by using the cut rule, okay? It just analyzes the component of what you're trying to prove. And so this sequent calculus here has built into it that the only thing you can do in order to prove something, or actually I should say verify to be precise, in order to verify it is decompose the things in gamma and delta and in A into the constituents and make sure that you can um, actually prove it only that way. The original sequence calculus does not have this property because it has a rule of cut. Okay. So the idea which, which um, has a pretty long tradition but, but most of us have learned from Martin Leff is the idea that the meaning of the logical connectives is determined by what counts as a verification of it. Okay. So when you think about the meaning of the connectives when you try to take this as a basis for understanding the meaning of a connective, you have the problem that because the cut rule might be applied, in order to find the meaning of something of a very small proposition, 
you might have to depend on the meaning of a very large proposition. So the meaning definition under that kind of uh, uh, interpretation doesn't really make sense because it's kind of circular. Okay? It doesn't really allow you to give a meaning explanation um, for the various connectives. If you only use the sequent calculus and you restrict yourself to verifications, which break down only the connectives, then you get a compositional semantics because you only need to know the meaning of the constituents to find out the meaning of the whole formula. And we have already been following this kind of technique. When I explained to you meaning of tensor, I said A tensor B is true if A and B are true in, this, uh, in the same state, um, and so on. And so we went through and we derived the rules for that. And um, so I gave you the rules to verify okay, whether these connectives are actually, whether um, what are the verifications for a proposition with starting with that connective? Okay. Um, and so this kind of technique for explaining the meaning of connectives can be you know, applied to many, many different logics. So it's a very general kind of concept. You can do modal logics, temporal logics, you know, intuitionistic and classical logics, and so on. And you just can you ask yourself the question each time, what is a decent calculus for verifications that can actually serve as an explanation for what the connectives mean? Okay. And whenever you do that, there's almost always this idea that um, verifications and uses have to be in balance. And if they're not, then there's something wrong with your logic. Okay. So either there's too many proofs because you can't eliminate the cut, or there's too few proofs because you can't prove the identity. Okay. So cut is always making sure that there are not too many proofs, right? Because we can find a proof of the conclusion if we have this one and this one. Identity is making sure that there are enough proofs that if you can use A, you can actually find um, a verification of A. Okay. Yeah? So, uh, for some other systems like natural deduction, um, the cut is already built into the rules kind of, so mm -hmm. we don't really need to verify it or that? Yes, we still need to verify something because in order to make, if you want to take a natural deduction definition as a definition of your logical connectives, um, then you still need to define a notion of verification, which you can do on natural deduction also. And then you need to show that everything that has a natural deduction also has a verification. Okay, but we don't actually use this cut. So. Well, there, there is an analog of the cut rule. Yeah. So I will talk about natural deduction soon, so um, you can ask your question again in case I forget to talk about it then. Yeah. Um, Okay, other questions? Okay, so, um, so we have now the, the, uh, this theorem, and we have admissibility of cut, and we have the fact that identity at arbitrary proposition can be reduced just to atomic type. Okay, but that still gives us, this gives us a fairly good characterization of proofs, of provability, let's say, by restricting the set of proofs very greatly from here to here. Okay, but there are still many other things that we can investigate about the structure of proofs in order to make proof search more efficient, okay? Um, or more directed, let's say. So the one very basic principle, okay, which comes up a lot. Um, by the way, from now on, when I write the double arrow, I really mean the one where the identity rule is only for atomic formulas, okay? Even though I didn't say that in the lecture notes for the last lecture, um, I will add that in, okay? So, one very important strategy um, is what we call inversion. Okay. So let's look at um, this one. So if you have delta, and I'm doing the purely linear case for the moment, and you try to prove A implies B. Okay. So this is the right rule. Okay. So in principle, when you're looking at this and you're trying to prove this, that's your goal that you're trying to prove. With these resources, I, I can prove A implies B, okay? In principle, you'd have to consider any possible left rule for things in delta, um, or applying the right rule to this. And if you have a gamma, then it also could be copying a formula from gamma that you could do. So there's many, many choices, as many as you have things in delta. These, that's pretty obvious, right? Now, the claim is that we don't actually have to make any real choices here. It's okay to always proceed like that. Why am I saying that? Yeah? 
Yeah, Jamie? Okay, what does that mean? It means that applying that rule will not, if you could, if you could prove the thing prior to applying that rule, you can prove the thing, at, you can prove the correct. Okay, so another way to say that is, is the following rule, Okay, so this is the inverse, okay? And the claim is that this rule is admissible, okay? So that when, oh, this rule is not the one that's admissible. Yeah, that's admissible too. Yep, right, so what I wanna hear is A arrow B, delta comma A, here's B. This is the one that's admissible, right? If this can be proven, then we can also prove that, okay? Now, this is not exactly everything that you might want, okay? Um, so, just the fact that this is also admissible isn't quite enough. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't because you also want to make progress towards your goal, right? So, um, it could be that, you know, you have some kind of empty rule that doesn't really make any progress Okay, um, but it's okay because the bottom and the top mean the same thing. Okay, so then you, you might hesitate applying it at least, at least infinitely often would probably be a bad idea because then you won't be able to prove your thing. Okay, but let's worry about that later. Let's for now just worry about the fact, is this rule invertible? And then we'll look at the other connectives and see whether these things are invertible. So the question, is this an admissible rule? <coughs> Okay, well, we have to prove that this rule is admissible. So how do we go about that? So claim. Any ideas? Yeah, Christina? Okay, so you're saying by induction on D, okay. So proof by induction on D, does it make sense? Okay, so if D was applied, if the right, last rule in D was the right rule for implication, then what? Then we're good because of the premise, so it's the thing we want. Right, then the premise is the thing we want and we're done, right? Okay, what about if it was a left rule? Presumably induction hypothesis. So let's try one case. Um, Delta comma A, uh, whoops, C tensor D, A implies B. And so this was because delta C comma B, A and B, and let's call this D prime, okay? Now by induction hypothesis, what do we get? Delta prime. Is it? C to D. Okay. Okay. So that's by induction hypothesis on D prime. Okay. And now? Now we apply the tensor left rule that we had before, and you reconstitute that proof. Okay? Okay, now there's a, there's a different way to prove this, which doesn't actually use induction. Can anybody see that? Identity expansion, okay, so I'm given this and I'm gonna to try to prove that. How do I use ex identity expansion? Okay, other suggestions? Think of the system we got. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, how do we do that? So we are given delta A implies B. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Delta A A implies B proves. Delta A A lolly B proves B. Actually, I think it's a little bit difficult in linear logic with the delta, so let's leave out the delta. Okay. Can we prove that? Well, how do we prove this? Okay, so A proves A and B proves B because that's, I guess in our system, that's the identity at A and that's the identity at B and this is the left rule for linear implication. Okay, and now by cut at A all at B, what's our conclusion? We carry through delta. Um, we get A from here, and we get B on the right-hand side, right? B comes from here. Uh, oh, that's what we needed. Okay. Okay. Now, anybody have, so we need two, actually three, admissible rules of inference, right? The identity at A, the identity at B, and the, here we need to cut at A or B, okay, in order to get this conclusion. Um, now, anybody want to hazard a guess what happens when you eliminate this cut? There is a cut. Yes, there's a proof without cut, which is great because we're working the cut-free system. It's not really a rule, right? It's an admissible rule. But if you have, there's a proof that this rule is admissible, right? Which corresponds to cut elimination. Now, if we apply cut elimination to this little proof, what do you think will happen? Yeah? Well, it's essentially like we're doing that first proof we talked about. Exactly. That little proof where we say that it goes by induction over the structure of D, we will actually do that proof if you do cut elimination on this one because this is the left rule here. So we go up in this, in this proof here until we have hit the right rule of A implies B, propagating it up, right? And when we hit the right rule for A implies B, okay, then the premise is going to be um, not exactly the one that we want here, but after some permutations, right? And we'll cut it with this. There's two identity cuts that result from that, which just make the whole thing go away, okay? So taking the, our procedure of cut elimination that we get from the proof of miscibility of cut, okay, simulates what we actually did here by hand, right? Except it's much simpler because we just, reply, we just refer to the lemmas instead of having to prove some complicated induction. And that means that as long as we continue to verify that identity and cut hold as admissible rules, we don't have to redo this proof. Okay? Because the reason that this proof works is essentially the same reason that admissibility of cut works here. So it's much nicer if we don't have to redo that argument. Okay. Um, okay. So... This is just another illustration how, how powerful cut is, okay? Because we can, for example, prove the invertibility of inference rules just by using cut, which is a nice thing to be able to do. Okay, so now we need to figure out which rules are invertible because invertible rules can always be applied without losing provability, so we can do that as long as we sh make sure we make progress, right? If we're not sure we make progress, then we might have to hesitate, but otherwise we can continue. So. So this rule is invertible. Okay, so here are the invertible ones. Um, so we have to look at different things. Tensor left, tensor right. Would tensor right be invertible? So tensor right says Can we always apply this rule? 
No. Nope. We need to know how to split the context. And can you think of an example where we can't apply this rule? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So if you want to apply the tensor right rule, there's no way we can split the context because there's only one thing in it. So it either has to go to the proof of A, with B is missing over here, or it goes to the proof of B and then A is missing over here. So we cannot apply the tensor right rule. Okay. So in fact, this remark brings me to a a very simple test, okay? If you want to know if a, if, a, if a rule is invertible, what you do is you look at the identity expansion and you see which rule did I apply first at the bottom, okay, for each connective. So the identity expansion for tensor, okay, this is the identity at A tensor B. If you expand that, we proceed first on the left, correct? We break down A tensor B and A comma B the reason we do that, then we can use a tensor right rule. A goes with the A and the B goes with the B. So we apply the left rule first. What that means is that tensor left rule is invertible. Okay. That's not a proof, okay. But that's the way it turns out. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. A lolly left. Would lolly left be invertible? By my test, no, because we already have the right rule. It's the first one we start with, so obviously we're not starting with the other one. Okay, so it should not be invertible. So, well, we should verify is by some kind of counterexample. Okay, what's the counterexample to prove that the left rule is not invertible? Yeah. A yep. A lolly b proves a lolly b. Because if we apply the left rule, we have to prove A from some assumptions. Well, there aren't any left. And then I get to use B. Well, we won't be able to prove either one of these. These because there's nothing left. And this because we have an extra A. So yeah, because we can't proceed on the left first. Okay, The left rule is not invertible. Okay. Now what you find is that for every connective, either the left or the right is invertible, and the other one isn't. Make sense? And if you want to know which one, you just look at the identity expansion, you see which one you use first. Okay? And the reason you use one of them first is because the other one doesn't work. So the other one is your counterexample, right? To the invertibility. Okay? Um, okay, so um, let's get some more invertible rules. We look at a connective by connective. Unit, one, one. Right or left rule? Okay, one entails one. Where do we start? <coughs> left. Okay. Um, with. A with B. Look at the other. Hmm? Yeah. This is amazing. We can prove these very, very quickly this way, right? <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Top. Okay, plus. Left. Because on the right, you would have to either prove A or prove B by in itself. You don't have a chance. Okay, zero. Left. Left, okay. Um, okay, bang. And we started on the left. I erased it, sorry, but we still remember it. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so one of these is actually, yeah? Um, is that true that the binary operator always go with the, uh, the, the unit? Yes. Yeah. Because it's the identity of it, so you can always expand, and then these always have to, these, these, and these two kind of go together. Um, Okay, um, 
Okay, there's one rule which, at least one rule, which is in some interesting way in, invertible, but it doesn't fit into this picture. Can anybody see which rule that is? Copy. Hmm? Copy. Copy. Okay, let's check that. You, we are going to suggest? Bottom. Bottom. Okay, well, bottom is not, it's not part of our logic, so. Oh. I was just hoping I could get you to talk about R. <laughs> okay. Well, it fits into the picture not at all until we get to the classical version of these rules. So, yeah. So I'm still looking for someone to do a guest lecture on that. Okay. Um, but, hmm? <laughs> Andre? I'm not sure he knows classical linear logic. But, um, okay. So, anyway, so there's one rule the copy rule. We should check the copy rule. Because, okay, so gamma A delta proves C, gamma A delta comma A proves C. So the invert, in, if I can write this, gamma A delta C copy inverse, uh, gamma A delta A arrow C. Okay, is that really invertible? Is this true? Whenever this is true, this is also true. You end up getting extra stuff. You're getting extra stuff. What's the counterexample? If delta is already A, Okay, we have A, A, arrow A. Obviously, we can prove that because it's an instance of the identity, but if we inverse copy, we have no way to recover. Right? So it's not invertible. Okay. Yeah? Any other suggestion which rule might be invertible? Hmm? Bang right. Bang right. Okay, so we have gamma dot proves bang A. Because gamma dot proves A. Okay, so the reverse of that would be we have a gamma nothing proves bang A. And then we can prove that A. How would we show that? If it's true. And if it's not, what's the counterexample? So this is the bang right inverse. We're not using any, there are no, there's nothing linear in the context. Right, that's because the right rule right. forces the linear context to be empty. Okay, so how do we go from here to here? How do we go from here to here? So we'll have that. So let's see if you internalize this trick with the cut. Suppose we have bang A on the left. Yeah. And you went to A. Okay. And you can get that by bang left. Bang left. And then copy. Copy identity, right? So bang A implies A. Agreed? Okay. So we apply our cut, and then the conclusion is uh, this goes away A. OK. So it follows by the admissibility of cut. OK, so this rule is invertible, which is nasty, because already the left rule is invertible. You have a question? Oh, Bill, uh, there's, um, they've also pointed out that uh, one right has the same Yes. OK, so one right has the same property because This is the, I mean, one left, one right, one right. This one is one right. Okay. Um, and what would the invertibility say? If the conclusion is true. Okay. If the conclusion, then nothing. Okay. Well, it's certainly true. So, okay. 
So what is it about these two things that do don't want me to put them in the picture? I don't want to put here, bang, right. First of all, it destroys what I wanted to set out, right? Because now I have the left and the right proof of bang in the same line. That's, okay, ugly. Okay, it's got to be wrong. So what is it about this rule that even though it's invertible, um, allows me not to put in that line? Yeah? Hmm? Yeah, not general enough. Okay, I think we're going in the right direction. You can only the the formula doesn't dictate what to do because you can't always apply the rule. Right. So the reason I looked at invertibility really, in some sense, is because I wanted to look at the formula, like a linear implication on the right, or width on the right, or a tensor on the left, and not at anything else, and just apply that rule. Okay. So you just look at this particular formula, and everything else should be irrelevant. Okay, um, so another way to say it, you can asynchronous, asynchronously decompose that proposition. Right? You don't have to look at anything else. When you see it, you can decompose it, no problem. But when you see a bang, there could be stuff in here, okay, and you cannot decompose it. You might have to wait until the context becomes empty, and then you can decompose it. Okay? So just looking at this thing, say, oh, I can decompose it, would be wrong, because you have to wait. Okay. These other rules don't have that property. If you see a top on the right, apply the top right rule. You're always done. If you see a one on the left, always eliminated from the context. Okay, you never have to look back, okay, no matter what the rest of the context is. So these, these rules are kind of special um, because of that. Okay. So you can also sort of slightly rewrite this. For example, if you said this would be the case if delta is empty, okay. put another condition up here. Um, so that would, that would say we can always do this, but we have to check this condition that cannot be checked asynchronously. But we're not used to writing the rules that way, so I'm not going to write it that way. Um, but keep in mind that just pure invertibility of the rule is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the ability to decompose that connective um, on that particular side, no matter what the rest of the sequence is. Okay. Okay, so let's see if we can use this in practice. Um, how useful it is. By the way, maybe I should introduce that terminology because I'm going to use it. So the connectors for which the right rules are invertible, which are arrow, um, so uh, width, and top, they are called negative. And the connectors for which the left rules are invertible. They're called positive. And there's more to say about that um, because um, um, the, the bang has a special status because it looks like it's positive, but there's this extra step in the identity expansion where you have to use the copy rule, and that will complicate this picture somewhat. Okay. Um, but this is the terminology. So um, just generally speaking, negative propositions are right invertible. Positive propositions are invertible on the left. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Uh, let's do uh, um, currying. Okay. Proves a tensor B arrow C. Okay. So I want to prove that this holds, or you know, if it doesn't hold, I want the counterexample. Um, so if I plan to prove this, how should I proceed? Okay. So every, yeah, we want to use the implies right. And now I know why it's okay to do that and never have to look at implies left. Okay. I don't have to try implies left and has to see it fails. Okay. Because, you know, this is an invertible, right rule is an invertible rule, so I can always apply the right rule. And so I get A arrow. B arrow C, and I get A tensor B, and I'm going to try to find a cut-free proof. So I'm looking at this. Now, what's the next thing I have to consider? Do I have to pause? Nope. Tensor left. Okay. A arrow, B arrow C, A, B, 
proof C. Okay? So now I have to pause, okay, because now none of the rules that I have available are invertible, but I have only one formula left. Okay? And so now when I do the when I apply the rule, I have to make some choices. What choices do I have to make? How to split the context into two pieces, right? Um, so this is another part of a non-determinism in proof search, which we'll have to address in a future lecture. But anyway, A goes here, and B implies C, and something else um, goes here. And we know that it'll have to be A here, okay? And then whatever remains, B goes here, and here we have B proves B, and C proves C, and these are all by identity, okay? Yes, which is admissible, but it's, it's hard to draw admissible rules. Okay. Okay. Um, so now the question is, well, let's, let's just speculate briefly about um, when I decided to apply the left rule here and I had to split my hypotheses, can anybody conjecture some way to figure out how way to propagate the assumptions? How would I, when you actually construct this proof, any ideas how I might go about? We could start by moving all the resources to uh, the left and like, cumulatively uh, get whatever we need on the right and we have a certain set of unused leftover resources. Okay, so an excellent idea. So we take all the resources we have, then move them to the left, sort of temporarily. Okay. So we make A and B available over here. Then we see we need A, and there's a B left over. We're not allowed to have anything left over. Okay. So we say, okay, well, the B is left over, so it must go over here. So we put the B here. Okay. And then we do the same thing. When you apply the left rule, we put all the resources, which is just B, over here. And we see it's being used, so nothing is propagated over here. So C is just by itself. And that's enough to prove that. Okay, so this way of dealing with resources in linear logic proofs is called resource management. So the question is, how do you propagate um, the resources that you have in the proof that you're actually constructing? And a very simple strategy, um, which actually, if you write it all down, turns out to be not so simple, is to take all the resources and basically give them to the first subproof, and you just see what you need, and then the other ones are moved over to the right. Okay. Okay. Um, so you already saw immediately why this wouldn't be so easy. <laughs> if this A was top, then this would be top. Okay. So now we don't know. Because the top is additive, it consumes everything in the context. Was the A used over here or not? Okay. So we say, well, maybe A was used, maybe it wasn't. We'll just flag it. Okay. Put it over here. So we definitely have a B. Um, well, actually, no, we don't even definitely have a B, right? Because we put A and B over here. We don't know what's actually being used. And so here, then we have, we have a B and a C, okay? Unless you don't turn out to need them, in which case we use them over here, okay? So, but there's further objections one can make, but I'm not inviting them right now, okay? Um, but you can see that it's not completely trivial in linear logic to do this kind of thing. In ordinary logic, these kind of properties don't come up. Okay, because you just, when you do this kind of a proof, basically you take the, the resources to all the premises and you don't worry about, you know, what happens to them. Okay, so let me see. Um, I wanted to get into uh, chaining. So, okay, so let me look at another example. Uh, okay. <coughs> So inversion is an extremely important property in about all the theorem provers that I know, whether they're working for classical logic or intuitionistic logic or type theory or whatever, take advantage of that, yeah? So why not put all the resources to the right, like do the same thing but the other way? Well, you could do that. Could. Yeah. Okay. So that doesn't make a difference? No. But Here's a better way to think about it, perhaps. What you do is you put both resources to both sides and you continue. Yeah, and 
and you put a constraint on them. Yeah, so what you do is, you, you know, each resource has like a little Boolean variable on it. Am I being used here or not? And just need to make sure that it gets the right flag. Okay. Um, so uh, if you want to do the, work, uh, the search sequentially, okay, which is going to be useful in logic programming, then we impose a fixed strategy. But in general, basically what you do, resource management is being reduced to some kind of uh, Boolean constraints on the, uh, on the resources. Okay, so um, let's see, here's another example, pretty simple one. Um, if I have A, A implies B, let's also put B in here, implies C, um, then, um, and C implies D, then I can prove D. Okay, so I've carefully arranged that nothing invertible, right? So probably there was some theorem down here that I tried to prove and I decomposed and I get to this stage and at this point there's nothing invertible left. Okay. Um, so now I have to make some choice. Okay. Obviously it doesn't make sense to try to apply the rule to B or an A or to D on the right hand side. So I have a choice between these two. Okay. So I can try to apply the left rule here or the left rule here. Okay. Um, which one could I apply? either one. So if I do this one, um, what happens with my, then D goes to D, right? So that's the easy part. And I take all the other resources to prove C. And should that work? Right. If I apply the rule here, then what happens? So I have to prove A from some, re it's like this, right? I have to prove A for some resources, which I'm going to use for that. Well, just A. And I have B together with B implies C, C implies D gets you D. Is that provable? Okay, so I can do either one. Okay. Now the interesting part about chaining is that I can reduce these choices to just one. Okay. So instead of giving you two choices, I'm going to give you just, I'm going to try to arrange it to this a unique thing you can do in this case. Okay. Um, any guess what that might be? Yeah? Right, so, um, so the idea would be that because D is your goal here, you would use this one first because you want to make the goal, you want to make the proof go towards D. So this is the only thing that we consider and applying left rule to here would fail because somehow the C that we come up with actually would be different from D, okay? So Rob is smiling, okay? Why is Rob smiling? You could do it another way. You could do it another way. Okay, so another way to do this, well, Rob, do you want to say it? Is that you uh, require that when you have to prove a subgoal, it be immediately present. Okay, so the other way to do it is that when you're trying to prove a subgoal A, okay, it must already be in the context. Okay, so in this case, we could apply the left rule here because we already have A. Does that remind of any rule that we had so far? Yeah. Homework one. Implication left prime, remember that? Remember that guy? We can apply the implication left rule only if the, if the left-hand side of the implication was already there, okay? So if we make that restriction, then the only rule that applies is left rule here because we can't apply it here because C is not already in the context, okay? So it turns out that we have two choices here about how we think about proof search, but no matter which one we make, either this is the only rule we can apply or this is the only rule we can apply. In one case, the left-hand side must already be in the context. In another sense, the right-hand side must already be the conclusion. Okay. And we rule out the other case. And we have to prove, and this is a hard thing to prove, that either one of these two restrictions, if we make it correctly, okay, will have the consequence that the theorems will stay the same. Okay. But search is greatly restricted, yeah? But, so in the second strategy, yeah. couldn't we actually have a situation where we had two rules uh, because we, we could have, if we, we have, have, a, yeah, if we have C in the context, then yeah. we have two guys. That's correct, correct. Yeah, so there's many theorems where you still have to make choices. Yeah. So you cannot eliminate choice entirely. And that's, that's a good thing because I already told you last time that once we add bang, it's undecidable. 
So if you eliminate all the choices, that would be unlikely. Okay. So, um, right. So we're not trying to eliminate all choices, but we're trying to, trying to limit it as much as we can. Okay. And being saying that, well, this implication left rule is ruled out, that's a fairly significant restriction. Or if you equally say this is ruled out because C doesn't already exist, that's also a fairly significant restriction of what you can do. So this, this choice here is called backward chaining. And if you make this, if you only allow this choice, this is called forward chaining. Okay. And so I won't be able to finish this in today's lecture, but next time um, we'll talk about forward and backward chaining okay, um, as techniques for reducing search space further. And it also has very important consequences um, in, in other applications of linear logic because um, the, uh, the system that results when you do both in, if you do both take care of inversion, what we did before, and also forward and backward chaining is called the focusing system as a very distinguished and important sort of place in applications of proof theory. So we'll see that, um, we'll see that next time. Let me see uh, what else I wanted to do. Um, okay, so let me give you, I have 10 minutes. So let me um, make a little bit of progress towards defining what backtrack chaining is supposed to do, okay? Um, and then we'll continue that next time. But I, I want to get started into it just a little bit. Um, okay. By the way, one interesting thing is that um, what rule here, what rules are eligible for forward or backward chaining? Well, in this case, it's implication left, which has the property that it's not eligible for inversion, okay? So it'll turn out that exactly the rules that are eligible for chaining is, are exactly the rules that are not on the board yet. So every rule in the calculus is either gonna be eligible for a chaining restriction or for an inversion property, okay? Um, and this is very, very clean in linear logic. If you go to other logics, um, you know, these kind of uh, things are less obvious and they're gonna be muddled up a little bit. So one of the reasons to study linear logic if you're interested in the structure of proofs is because it's very elementary. There's very, um, everything is very clean and orthogonal. If you go to intuitionistic logic, it becomes more complicated. If you go to classical logic, it becomes even more complicated. So here everything is sort of in its raw and sim simple form. And this is a very nice thing. Okay, so let's see if we can capture this. Yep. Right. So when I say inversion from now on, I mean the property of inversion that says we can take that and asynchronously decompose it. Okay, so not just invertible. Not just that the rule technically is invertible, but you can always take that connective and decompose it when you see it. Okay, okay so the way we capture, and this is a, again a very general thing that happens when you do proofs and also programming languages, is that when you capture, when you want to capture a particular strategy, the way you do it is you write a new set of inference rules so that if you follow these rules and proof construction, it will do only what you want and you rule out other things. So we already did that once, right? We had a system with cut and then we wrote another system that was relayed in a very simple way, just taking out, well, one and a half rules, right? All of cut and identity we left in only for atomic propositions. So we have two systems. In one you can use cut, the other one you're not allowed, okay? So now, I want to write a rules, a set of rules in which chaining is actually forced. Okay, so the only proofs you can find are the ones that proceed by chaining. And actually, let's look at um, backward chaining, okay? The other one is symmetric, so it doesn't matter which one we start with, okay? So how do we force backward chaining, okay? And so the basic idea is the following. If we have a delta and an A, and we're trying to prove C, okay? Or we can say well, we're now going to focus and chain on this proposition A. And I'm going to write it like this. Okay, so this is a formula which we call in focus. And now we're only allowed to apply 
rules to formula and focus. Okay. And there's a corresponding rule where we decide we're going to focus on the right-hand side. Okay. So this is a focus left, and this is a focus right rule. Okay. Now, there are some restrictions here. Any care to guess what kind of restriction you want to apply? They're not invertible. They have to be in the right class. They have to be eligible, eligible for um, chaining, right? So which formulas are eligible for chaining here? The positive or the negative ones? The negative, right? Because the negative ones is where the right-hand side is invertible. Okay, so the left-hand side is not invertible. So those are the ones that are eligible. So if I write it like this, this is a negative formula, then we're allowed to focus on it. Okay. Now, can anybody make a wild guess when I'm allowed to focus on the right? It's to also, it better be a positive formula, and then I'm allowed to focus on it. Okay. Because if, I'm, if it's not, then it's an invertible rule. And that's not allowed to be in focus because I only want the things that are eligible forward to chaining. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we can write some rules. Okay. So the interesting thing is let's concentrate on the left focus here. That the left rules for negative connectives can only be applied when the formula is in focus and not in any other way. Okay. So I would have a rule such as if I have delta and I have a with B, and I'm trying to prove C, then I would do this, okay? And there's a symmetric version, okay? Um, interesting rule is if it's A implies B, and I'm trying to prove C, okay? What's the left rule for implication? From delta, I have to prove A. And from delta prime and B, I have to prove C. By the way, I shouldn't have used the double arrow there. Um, so replace the double arrow by a uh, single arrow. Okay. Be because I don't want to change the judgment we already have, I want to define a new one. So these are all just or single arrows. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so now here I have to pause for a second. So clearly I want to apply left rules, okay, only to the formula in focus, so B stays in focus. Okay. But what about A? Well B can be anything too, right? It's just underneath an arrow. So we want to preserve the focus of the, sub, of the portions of the thing that we're in, 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 in all, on all the sides. Okay. So now we come to something we didn't discuss before, but um, implication is itself negative. Okay. But the left-hand side of it is positive. Because when you apply the implication right rule, you move it from the right-hand side of the, of the sequence to the left-hand side of the sequence. So it changes what we call polarity because now it's on the right-hand side. Okay. So we would expect there to be a positive formula here, even though this subformula is negative. In contrast, with would be something like this, A minus with B minus. So you would expect the components to be, again, negative. Okay. So you continue to focus on that, on A here and on A here, and you would expect this to be positive. Now, eventually, you're going to run out of things that chain together, yeah? Yeah, right. So eventually what happens is that one of these formulas turns out to be not of the polarity that you expect. Then you have to stop your chaining, right? Because you're not supposed to chain. So there's a rule that is something like this. If I have delta and I have something positive in focus, then I'm not eligible to chain, so I have to lose my focus. And I go to that. And conversely, if I'm on the right, um, 
and I have C, uh, which is negative. Okay, I'm not allowed to chain when something is negative. So I lose my focus and go back to the single error judgment. Okay. So even though when I start, it has to be of the right polarity, um, okay, I can continue there as long as I continue to have the right polarity. Okay. But when I come to something that's of a different polarity, then I actually have to lose my focus and go back to the other judgment. Okay. So let's look at what happens here. So this is the last thing I do in lecture today. If you focus on A implies B implies C here, okay, what will happen? So let's write this out. So in the first step, I focus on A arrow, B arrow, C, and have other stuff. Um, and the thing I'm trying to prove here is D. Okay. So the first thing is I'm still focusing on A. And here I'm focused on B implies C. And my right-hand side is D. Then I focus here on B, and then I focus on C, and the right-hand side is D. Okay. So I haven't shown you how the resources are propagated, but we'll solve that problem later. Okay. So now I come to this part here, and I say from C in focus, I have to prove D. And I can't break this down anymore, because that's basically an atomic proposition at this point. Okay. So at this point, what I want to do is I want to say, well, this wasn't really el eligible to focus on because this C doesn't match this D. So what I want to say here now, this fails. Okay? I cannot actually focus on this. I want to rule out this. Okay? And the way we do that is that we say, um, we have the following rule. If I'm in delta and I'm focused on an atomic proposition and I'm trying to prove the same atomic proposition, then I'm done. I might use the identity at P, okay? And that's okay. Even Rob will be satisfied because that's really a rule, okay? But, no, you're not. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. And then on the other side, if we have focused on P and the right hand side is Q, okay, then there's no rule. If P is different from Q. Okay? Okay. And so the little piece that Rob wants me to fill in here is that this atomic formula has to be designated to be negative. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Actually, Q doesn't have to be Whatever. No Let's come back to this next time. Okay, okay you had a question? Oh, we also in positive version of which you have the focus on the other side. Ah, yeah. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> This is Rob's plan here. Okay. So if I'm focused on a positive atomic formula, then I succeed if the P is the same. Okay. And I fail if this is not P over there. Okay. All right, so now, you know, I can't prove this right now, but can I show you next time? If you take all these atomic formulas, A, B, C, and D, and you make them negative, negative, okay, then this is the only thing you can focus on because it'll fail right here, if not. If you make all of them positive, then this is the only thing you can focus on, okay, because only A and B are already in the context, okay.